The Center for World War II Studies and Conflict Resolution at Brookdale Community College presents its Fall 2011 Lecture Series, Unwavering Devotion to Duty, Thomas Holcomb and the Marine Corps, 1936 to 1943. Our guest lecturer is Dr. David Ulbrich, PhD, historian with the U.S. Army Engineer School, Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. Introducing Dr. Ulbrich is Professor Paul Zygo, director of the Center for World War II Studies at Brookdale. I want to welcome you to the opening session of the Center for World War II Studies and Conflict Resolutions World War II Studies series. A number of you are veterans and welcome you back. For those who are brand new, again, welcome. What we have here is a program that we've been running now for 11 years. And what we're offering this time around is a series of five programs pertaining to various aspects or various topics regarding World War II, its history as well as its impact. And tonight, what we have is a speaker that's going to talk about the development of the United States Marine Corps and how important it was to have that development just prior to World War II. Because via that development, the Marine Corps turns out to be the premier fighting force all throughout the Pacific during the Second World War. Individual that's going to tell that story is Dr. Dave Olbrich, who's come to us from Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. He's written a book, and that book will be offered for sale after the program is over with. So just wanted to warn you that there will be a sales pitch during the course of during the course of the of the program. Now as far as the other programs, they're all listed on the back of the handout that was given to you. And you're welcome back to come to any of the events. And one thing I do want to point out to you, one of those programs is our annual dinner dance that for the first time in eleven years will not be held at Gibbs Hall, Fort Monmouth. As many of you know, Fort Monmouth closed officially on 15 September of this month. With this being the case, the dance has now been shifted to the PNC Reception Center next to the Art Center off of the Parkway. And it's going to be held on the day before Veterans Day, which will be November 10th. So we'd like you to keep that in mind. We'd welcome you all to come on and up and enjoy a very, very delightful evening of swing era music. It's a dinner and a dance that will start at 6 and go through to about 10 o'clock at night. Welcome all of you to come. As far as the other programs, well, again, they're noted on the, on the program, and we'd all, by all means, like to have you back throughout the next couple of months. All right. With this being the case, well, then let me introduce our guest speaker. Our guest speaker has been with us for the, several times in the past, and he's spoken about various aspects of World War II history. Well, today he has the interesting topic as noted before. His bio is within the program itself. So if you would take a look at that, but after doing so, We'll then in turn ask Dave to begin his presentation. So let me officially welcome Dr. David Albrecht. Dave. Thank you, Paul. Uh, it has been my, this will be my fourth time lecturing here. Uh, I think the first one was 2003. So, you know, it's, it's been eight years and, and Paul and, and Brookdale Community College have always treated me very, very well. I appreciate their hospitality and their generosity and their support of my professional career. So thank you, Paul. All right. A number of people ask me, how is it that you work for the engineer school, the U.S. Army Engineer School, and write about Marine Corps history? That's a really good question. It gets even more sort of interesting, maybe, or odd. I don't know which. Uh, I was an oops baby. I was born when my father was 50. Uh, and uh, he was a World War II veteran, actually in the Army Air Force, flying, at, flying with the 15th Air Force out of southern Italy. So I kind of grew up with some of the stories and, of, of World War II. Uh, and of course, being a Great Depression era baby that he was, he wanted me to become an engineer like he was, a mechanical engineer. I tried that for a year, and then physics and calculus just really did me in. So I made the jump to history. 
but it was more of a natural jump, and I wanted to, you know, very much enjoy what I was doing, and and I do. So I was brought up. I was brought up in Dayton, Ohio, going to the U.S. Air Force Museum at Dayton, Ohio, and then when I got to graduate school, I was looking for a, a, a master's thesis topic, and my advisor suggested Thomas Holcomb and the Defense Battalions. That became my master's thesis. Uh, the Marine Corps was very generous with grant money, and that, in turn, became my dissertation, which in turn now has become my book. So I started working on this topic about 1994. So. It's now 17 years later, uh, and my, my baby's graduated. It's now in print. So anyway, that's the background. And now I uh, serve a corps of a different sort, the Corps of Engineers, not the Marine Corps. All right, before you saw the title of this talk, how many of you had heard of Thomas Holcomb? All right, a few. All right, a few. That's generally about the, about the percentage. Thomas Holcomb gets sandwiched as Commandant of the U.S. United States Marine Corps, the senior Marine officer, the service chief, in between John Lejeune in the 1920s, or I guess I should say for your sake, John Lejeune in the 1920s, and then Alexander Vandergrift in the later in the 1940s. Vandergrift became Commandant in 1944 and saw the Marines through the end of World War II and through the unification crisis. Well, Holcomb, Thomas Holcomb served for seven years and one month in the middle of those, in between those two commandants. And it's my contention that he's been given short shrift in the history. They, not enough historians have paid enough attention to him. Uh, when he took over as commandant of the U.S. Marine Corps in December 1936, the Marines numbered less than 18,000 officers and men. That was smaller than the New York City Police Department at the time. When he retired December 31st, 1943, then Marines numbered close to 400,000 men. So in, in seven years and one month, he saw the growth from 18,000 to nearly 400,000 Marines. My initial questions were, were, how did he do it and was he successful? Those were my two questions. How did he do this and was he successful? And to do that, I spent years doing research and have 25,000 pages of photocopies and a lot of college debt. But I tracked all the way back to the beginning of his career, indeed into his uh, childhood. He got his commission in 1900. He actually tried to get his commission in the U.S. Marine Corps in 1898. But he was about five foot four at the time, and when he walked up to the Marine recruiter, he was too thin, and the Marine recruiter in 1898 said, son, I'm sorry, you couldn't stand the gaff, which means you couldn't, in, in that time period, means you couldn't keep up with the, with the requirements. So he went to work uh, as, as an apprentice clerk at a steel mill uh, in the accounting department of a steel mill, uh, got some practical experience that way, and then tried again in 1900 and was able to become an officer by examination. He also grew a little bit. And the rumor is, although I've never been able to prove it, is that he had himself stretched, which would not have been a very pleasant experience at that time. Anyway, he gets his commission in 1900. That is, that may be his commissioning photograph. Certainly, it's early 1900, so he has this very much, you know, boyish look about him. He would serve for the next 43 years, and he would serve as commandant, as I said, from 1936 to 1943. As a young officer, he made his name and his fame within the Marine Corps as a rifleman. As a civilian, he had never hardly even shot a gun, shot a rifle. When he gets in the Marines, he discovers that he is a crack shot. And indeed, from about 1900 up until about 1913, he either shoots on or commands the rifle team for the U.S. Marine Corps, garnering team world championships and individual world championships. Here's a great photograph of him. He's standing on the left there. Uh, Captain Thomas Holcomb at the time with the uh, winning American rifle team for the international matches in Peking, China in 1910. So, and if you know the scores, you can see the scores down here. They're actually pretty good, pretty good scores for the team, if you know anything about competitive shooting. So he makes his name and his sort of fame within the Marine Corps. It's due to his efforts, and then when he becomes commandant and throughout his career, he emphasized, uh, emphasizes marksmanship. It's through his efforts that every Marine is considered a rifleman, and every Marine is a rifleman. 
Uh, so he has, he has a hand in that. Uh, <clears throat> also in China, he ends up uh, in China for about 13 years of his career between uh, 1900 and 1930. 13 years of his career. He does one six-year tour. He gets uh, uh, renewed from 1908 to 1914. So he, he, he got to learn the Chinese language. He learned the culture. He uh, learned about you know, the differences between the nationalists and the communists. In fact, I have one of his examinations, his Chinese language examination, with the evaluation from his instructor that said he could read like a native and, and speak well enough to go out in the countryside by himself and, inter and interact with the uh, Chinese population. So he, he really enjoyed this tour in China. At that time, China, being in China, was a plum appointment. It was the favorite appointment overseas for Marines. It was inexpensive to live there. It was also kind of an exotic environment, and he very much enjoyed his time in China. Well, when World War II, or when World War I came along, and the United States entered in 1917, April 1917, Thomas Holcomb was a major. He was working at headquarters Marine Corps, where he got to know, uh, you know, a fellow named Pete Ellis, who's very big in amphibious warfare. He, he worked directly for John Lejeune, who was a colonel at the time. He also got to know then Assistant Secretary of the State Franklin Delano, or Assistant Secretary of the Navy rather, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Well, when the United States enters the war in April 1917, the Marines want a piece of the action. It's important that even though there are only about 9,000 Marines in combat at any given time out of a million American soldiers in the AEF, 9,000 Marines uh, were important for the Marines to maintain some sort of, you know, uh, kind of uh, 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 public visibility. Holcomb was able to command a battalion. He commanded this battalion at the Battle of Bellow Wood, 2nd uh, Battalion, 6 Marines, and uh, you can see him uh, working his way, uh, he commanded the unit that uh, marched across the famous wheat field towards the uh, French village of Bresh. And he was, uh, he was uh, wounded, he was, uh, uh, suffered gas attacks, and if you know anything about that wheat field, it was green wheat, and several thousand Marines marched across the field and faced withering fire. It was there that he got his spurs in combat and that he also uh, established himself as a very good leader. He never got upset. He never lost his temper. He was always calm and decisive. This would help him for the rest of his career because nothing seemed to phase Thomas Holcomb, no matter what. After you've been through something like that, trench warfare is, is uh, and World War I combat was horrific, and after you've been through that, then most other things pale in comparison. He definitely gained leadership experience and combat experience. In fact, uh, he received one um, a, a croix de guerre uh, from the French army, uh, and this was this part of the citation. It says, commanding a battalion and a regiment of Marines on a front which was being violently attacked thanks to his untiring energy, the exactness of his judgment, and his tactical knowledge, Holcomb maintained his battalion on this line, uh, later taking the uh, village of Beresh and repulsing a number of counterattacks, end quote. I might add, I work for the engineers, so the engineers helped the village. His battalion was cut to pieces only at half strength by the time he took the village, and 175 army engineers reinforced them and helped build the defenses and, and defend that village uh, for another several days. So the Marines also, I mean, the engineers also helped the Marines. I got to make that, I got to throw some props to my current employer. I wonder if anyone will be listening or will watch this back there. Who knows? We'll see. There Holcomb is uh, on one of his hunting expeditions in China. As I said, he spent 13 years in China total. This is on a hunting trip in northern China. Uh, he's in plain clothes, he's got a scruffy-looking beard, and he's practicing his marksmanship. He's also gathering intel. He would have been going through China to, to spy on the Chinese military and, you know, spy on any later on in the 1920s and early 30s to spy on the Japanese uh, in northern China. This was an intelligence-gathering operation, not merely a hunting trip. 
And by the way, these photographs were donated by the family, uh, Thomas Holcomb's late daughter-in-law and his granddaughters. So these photographs appear in my book, but these are the, f these are the first time, other than my book, anyone's seen these, these photographs. So they're, uh, they're very rare and, and very interesting. All right, we get up to the 1930s. And in the 1930s, you have what could be considered the golden age of Marine Corps uh, 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 ideas and doctrine. In the early 1930s, the Small Wars Manual was written by the Marines, and Thomas Holcomb had a hand in the writing of that. Small Wars Manual was based on 30 years of occupation duty that the Marines had undertaken in Central America, in Haiti, uh, in Nicaragua, in the Dominican Republic, and in Cuba. You also had two other manuals, tentative manuals, looking into the future, one on landing operations, that would be the Bible for amphibious warfare in World War II, and one on base defense that would tell how to defend against an enemy assault, that would be the Bible for base defense in World War II. And Thomas Holcomb had a hand to one degree or another in all those publications. He was at that point a uh, commandant, or you might say dean, of the Marine Corps schools at Quantico. He had been involved in earlier war planning. He understood uh, you know, the Japanese threat, and then he was able to offer advice to uh, the Navy and the President and Congress on the Japanese threat, but then also put that into, into practical applications uh, in terms of developing Marine Corps doctrines, Marine Corps policies and procedures on how to attack uh, an enemy, enemy beach. He becomes Commandant in December of 1936. He was the Junior Brigadier General uh, in the Marine Corps. There were seven or eight senior officers, one and two star generals ahead of him. And uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt decided to reach down and have Thomas Holcomb leapfrog all those senior officers. Why? Because Thomas Holcomb had what, was, uh, what impressed Franklin Delano Roosevelt as leadership ability and managerial skills. And, you know, it, 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 for my father's generation, there isn't... There's no, there's no neutrality about Franklin Delano Roosevelt. You either loved him and he's up there on top of mantle with, you know, Jesus' uh, painting and, and John F. Kennedy and FDR, or as my father did, you thought he was the Antichrist. Well, one thing I can give Franklin Delano Roosevelt that transcends both those, you know, sort of images of Roosevelt is that he was able, he had this uncanny ability to pick the right subordinates. I mean, he picked Marshall, he picked Eisenhower, uh, he picked Nimitz, uh, and these officers jumped over more senior officers to land in their command positions. Franklin Delano Roosevelt also picked Thomas Holcomb. Remember, back in World War I, they had worked together in Washington, D.C. Then, during the 1930s, when Thomas Holcomb was stationed in White, uh, uh, Washington, D.C., uh, before he became commandant and then after he became commandant, his son got this really bad fe fever. His son was 13 or 14 years old, got a really, really bad fever that left him bedridden for six months. His muscles atrophied. Thomas Holcomb's son, Franklin's muscles atrophied. And he had to work out. He had to, he had to go swimming. The best way for him to rebuild his muscles was to swim. Well, Tommy Holcomb was good friends with Franklin Roosevelt, so Tommy Holcomb would drive to work from the Commandant's mansion, go past the White House, drop off his son at the White House to swim in the White House's pool, and then pick him up on his way home, or pick him up for lunch and take him home. So there had been, you know, personal connections between Roosevelt and Holcomb, but Roosevelt assessed in Holcomb an, an uncanny, or had uh, he, Roosevelt had this uncanny ability to assess potential in his subordinates and put the right subordinates in the right places at the right time. Holcomb uh, was, once Holcomb became commandant, he becomes very much involved in all aspects of Marine Corps activities. He's very much involved with public relations. In fact, it was Thomas Holcomb that really started the combat correspondence program during World War II, for example. Holcomb was also actively involved in the development of uh, amph amphibious operations, development of am amphibious equipment, such as the LCVP, otherwise known as the Higgins boat. The original Higgins boats, if you go back here, here Thomas Holcomb is standing, there's Howling Mad Smith, there's Holcomb, there's Secretary of the Navy Frank Knox, 
and this was a joint operation with the 1st Infantry Division, so there's then Colonel Teddy Roosevelt Jr. They're looking off in the distance, and this is what they're seeing, joint Army and Marine Corps landing operations. Yes, that's the Higgins boat, but you notice this is 1941, December, uh, uh, July of 1941, you notice that the Higgins boat doesn't have the bow ramp. Well, the bow ramp idea had been around since 1930. In fact, uh, a young lieutenant named Victor Krulak had observed a Japanese crossing of a river near Shanghai in 1937 and saw this, this boat called the Daihatsu boat. And it had this, this bow ramp that when it would run up on the shore, the ramp would go down and the soldiers could run off the ramp directly onto the shore. He thought it was a great idea, drew it up, made a model, and sent it back to headquarters Marine Corps. Here's a lowly lieutenant sending a model and an idea back to the two-star general who's commandant of the Marine Corps. Holcomb liked it. Howling Mad Smith liked it. The Marine Corps Equipment Board bought into it. But it was 1937, and there's no money for research and development. They put it on the shelf so that when you do get to 1941-42, and the money is much more forthcoming from Congress because there's either going to be a war or there is a war, they were able to take that idea, work with Andrew Jackson Higgins of Higgins Boat fame, and develop the, um, the, uh, the very famous uh, LCVP, the, the landing craft. So Holcomb's very much even involved with that. He's up here at the highest level making strategic decisions, but he's cultivated a system and organization in the Marine Corps where there is vertical communication. So someone, a lowly lieutenant in China, can send an idea around on the other side of the world and get a hearing with the senior officers, and it will be acted upon, assuming there's money. But if there's any money, they can't act on it. But by the time we get up to 1941, 42, the money was forthcoming from Congress. Guadalcanal. Guadalcanal represented the first big test in World War II for the United States Marine Corps and for this amphibious doctrine. Here is uh, it's down in the south, uh, southern Pacific, southwest Pacific, there's Australia, New Zealand, and Guadalcanal's right here in the Solomons Island. The Marines land on Guadalcanal August 7th, uh, 1942, and uh, um, Tulagi and, and uh, Gavutu, uh, 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 Gavuto, nearby islands, August 7th, 1942. The commander of that Marine Corps division was a fellow named Alexander Vandegrift, who Holcomb had kind of drawn along. He was subordinate to Thomas Holcomb, but Holcomb kind of, you know, kind of nurtured him and mentored him so that he was ready to be a division commander. And the uh, family, Thomas Holcomb's family, had donated the actual letters or uh, transcripts or letters that Alexander Vandergrift had written while on the island uh, that were sent back to Thomas Holcomb. One of those included these two hand-drawn maps of uh, Guadalcanal. Here's the main island. Uh, there's the, the defenses that uh, Holcomb uh, picks up. There's the airfield, the Henderson Field that was all important. There's the grassy knob. Right about there to the south is where you would have uh, the uh, Battle of uh, uh, Edson's Ridge. This is uh, Florida, Tulagi, uh, Gavato, these islands here. These are the plans to where the Marines would attack on Blue Beach and work their way east and west. So what you have here are handwritten maps that no one else has seen. These were, these were drawn up on August 11th, four days after the uh, amphibious assault on August 7th, and sent back to Thomas Holcomb. Thomas Holcomb had this ability or this desire to really keep up with his subordinates. And he'd reach down into the weeds. He would get down and ask for great detail of how uh, a particular operation or battle or how a particular piece of equipment was going, how it was being developed. And he had this ability to take that input all these different details and structure it in his mind and then come up with the next step or the next stage or the best decision about where to go as a Marine Corps or which equipment to fund or what have you. He develops this over time. It's a very impressive sort of uh, uh, ability that he had. Speaking of Guadalcanal, here's a uh, handwritten or a hand-drawn map 
Uh, about three or four days after the Battle of Edson's Ridge started, the famous Battle of Bloody Ridge or Edson's Ridge. Here's, uh, here's the ridge right here. And the Japanese came up from the south, which is off the page, and worked, tried to attack Edson's Ridge, worked their way along the spine of the ridge, and capture the airfield. And of course, that's where Chesty Puller, you know, really gains a lot of fame. Well, Holcomb, Thomas Holcomb wrote, or I mean, Alexander Vandegrift, rather, wrote a letter back to Thomas Holcomb explaining, a report back explaining exactly what happened in that battle. And he had this hand-drawn map that basically showed where the battle was. And you can see jungle, 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 uh, infiltrator, uh, grass, the airfield, you can see the different defenses, coconuts, uh, here's uh, Tenaru River there. It's, it's all very sort of, it's almost like, you know, kids with a crayon. But as a historian, this is some of the coolest stuff I've ever, I've ever found. Holcomb absorbed all this and realized that Guadalcanal was not just a little battle for an uh, airfield on a remote island. Guadalcanal, as it went from weeks into months, became a test, not only for the Japanese logistics and their fighting ability, but also for the Americans. By the time you get up to September or October, both sides were, to draw an uh, analogy from poker, both sides were pot committed. They need, both the Japanese and the Americans needed to continually commit more and more men, more and more airplanes, more and more ships to this ongoing campaign because the winner of that campaign would find out the weaknesses of the enemy and weaken the enemy. And as it worked out, uh, the Americans, the Marines, and together with the soldiers and, and a whole lot of sailors were able to prevail. Holcomb himself visited uh, Guadalcanal uh, in October, late October and early November. Holcomb took a five-week, 25,000-mile junket from Washington, D.C., all the way to Guadalcanal and back. Here we have some uh, photographs that were donated by the family. There's Holcomb talking with uh, Merritt Edson, who was uh, one of the uh, tactical commanders there, and there's Vandegrift, who was the Marine Division commander. This is Vandegrift sitting in a rubber boat and Holcomb trying to balance to get on the rubber boat. That's pretty, you know, that's, that's really kind of highfalutin, kind of really glamorous transportation, especially for a service chief, don't you think? And of course, there'd be gators all around and probably big old mosquitoes and spiders and everything. This, this, was not, this was not a just pleasant trip. When Holcomb landed, he was landing on it, he and his staff were landing on a couple of transport planes with fighter escort, and one of his aides remembers in an oral history that he was literally riding on a 500-pound bomb because they, you know, the, the, the Navy or the Army and the Marine Corps couldn't have, uh, afford to send a transport plane just with the commandant. They had to send more supplies with the commandant. So he's landing to an artillery barrage. But then once he's there, the morale of the Marines on Guadalcanal soared. Holcomb was not an imposing physical personality. He was not particularly charismatic. But after 42 years of being a Marine, after having been gassed in World War I, having fought at Bella Wood, having proven himself as an expert marksman, as the expert world champion marksman, he had his subordinates respect. So when the Commandant of the Marine Corps came to visit, he, uh, uh, the morale of the Marines soared. You can see this in everything, or in, in memoirs from enlisted personnel, all the way up to, uh, 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 to colonels and senior staff on the island. They were very, very excited. And then this other photograph, I believe, is a photograph of Edson's Ridge, which would have, the Battle of Edson's Ridge would have happened about six weeks earlier. Holcomb went out and walked the ground with his officers to see what really happened at Edson's Ridge. I'm not sure of that, but I think that is Edson's Ridge. Maybe some of you are... Our uh, veterans and might actually be able to clarify that for me. But, yeah, very good, very good. Well, thank you. Go, let me go back here. Edson's Ridge. All right, another thing that Thomas Holcomb does, this wasn't near, merely a trip to increase the morale of the troops, although it certainly did increase the morale of the troops. 
Uh, Holcomb was also there to report back to Franklin Roosevelt how things were really going. You know, when we think of battles, or when, I don't know, maybe not we, but when people think of battles, you think maybe the Battle of Midway, it's over in whatever, 20 or 30 minutes as the dive bombers destroy three out of four Japanese aircraft carriers. Maybe a battle lasts three days like Gettysburg. No, this battle, this campaign, this operation lasted six months from August 42 all the way up to February 43. And in October, even late October, it was not a sure thing that the Americans were going to win the battle for Guadalcanal. The operation, the campaign for Guadalcanal, it was not a sure thing. So obviously Vandegrift and the naval officers had been reporting back to, to, to the Navy Department and to Franklin Roosevelt and to Congress, but Holcomb wanted to go there and see for himself and report back. So that was another important uh, feature in his visit. Lastly, when he was there, he works with uh, Vandergrift and with recently promoted Vice Admiral William Bull Halsey to restructure the command relationship uh, between the Navy and the Marine Corps for amphibious assault. Under the old system, the naval commander had, uh, had control of every phase of an amphibious assault, the planning, the voyage, the ship-to-shore movement, and even inland operations. And the naval commander in this case was a fellow named Richmond Kelly Terrible Turner. And he was a very intelligent man and knew it, and he wanted you to know it also. And uh, uh, Rear Admiral Turner would stick his nose into Marine Corps business, inland, even weeks into the campaign. He wanted to order Vandergrift where to move his troops, where to defend, where to set up his de uh, defenses. And this was, you know, upsetting to Vandegrift because Turner wasn't trained in ground warfare. He was a master at naval logistics, uh, a master at war planning, but not in ground operations and ground warfare. So Holcomb basically engineers this, uh, this change in doctrine that allows the Marine commander, once the beachhead is established, and this also helped Army commanders over in Europe, by the way, um, Marine commander, once it's established, once the beach has, head is established and the Marines are offloading and driving inland, that the, uh, um, that the uh, uh, Marine commander and Navy commander would be co-equals. That would give the Marine commander independence of movement. It would also give the Marine commander the ability to talk with the senior officer above the Navy, uh, the Navy task force commander, the theater commander, and ask for more resources. And Holcomb helps to engineer this. He helps to engineer it uh, with William Bull Halsey. Then Halsey sends a telegram to, uh, uh, I guess I should start this way. I'm looking at it this way. For, for, for audience left, you're down here, and you're moving this other way. So down here, you've got Halsey, Holcomb, and Vandegrift. Holcomb engineers this change in doctrine, and Halsey sends a, a, telegram, a couple of telegrams ahead of him to Nimitz as Holcomb's flying back to Pearl Harbor. Sells Nimitz on the idea. Holcomb gets there and says, sir, I want to change the doctrine. And uh, Nimitz says, this is a great idea. Nimitz sends another telegram to Ernest King back in Washington, D.C. Ernest King buys in on it, but, but buys off on it, and Holcomb flies back to Washington, D.C., and he goes in, Sir, um, Chief of Naval Operations King, can we change this about amphibious doctrine? Yes. So Holcomb basically is the driving force. So his visit had three purposes, to raise the morale of the troops, also to give him a chance to report back to Washington, D.C. about what's really happening, and thirdly, to change this, this doctrine. All these things showed his leadership ability, Holcomb's leadership ability, and also his sense of management. Uh, at the time, it was, there was a word called progressive, or a term called progressive management. And this is concerned with structures and functions and streamlining and efficiency and rationality, all that sort of thing. He bought into that style of management. He needed to manage a Marine Corps expansion from 18,000 officers and men to 385,000 officers and men. Yet still, even though boot camp was decreased in time, even though uh, the Marines would have had their versions of the 90-day wonders, yet still all those Marine enlisted and all those Marine officers needed to come in and be um, inculcated and uh, you know, basically inculcated with marine esprit, with marine elan, with what it was to be a marine. So that took some real management skills. And Holcomb was also blessed to have very good subordinates. And like any good leader or management manager, he was not afraid 
to remove his subordinates from command if he didn't think they could uh, deal with the challenges. And he did. Two very close friends he had to remove from command and replace him with, with uh, replace them with what he thought were better officers, even though he's his close, uh, even though they were his close friends. So he's he's got this very good management style, but then he's also acutely aware that management, great uh, organizational flow charts and policies and procedures don't work unless you have a personality that runs that organization. And Holcomb, by virtue of his experience in World War I, his education, his, um, his, his accomplishments, uh, and this level of respect that he developed over his career was the right person to be able to run that, that system. Again, if you've got you know great organizational chart, but lousy leadership, you can't get, get anything done. So he had this, the, the effective leadership and the, offense, and the efficient organization. So he's a progressive in, store, in terms of management, what was uh, progressive at the time, what was used as a, uh, was, was called progressive management at the time. Um, however, I've just kind of uh, really painted this you know, glowing picture of, uh, of Thomas Holcomb's skill as a marksman, of his, you know, his experience in World War I, of uh, his commandancy, he did have two um, shortcomings. Uh, they were related to social issues. When it came time to allow African Americans and women into the Marine Corps, he resisted that bitterly. Uh, he had been uh, born in 1879. He had grown up as a teenager in the 1890s. It would have been the talk of the, uh, the kitchen table in a very small Washington, D.C., about a court case called Plessy v. Ferguson that talked about making African Americans and Caucasian Americans in separate but equal uh, you know, establishments, whether it's education or, or whatever. Of course, we know that the, the, the separate was definitely separate. The equal was often anything but equal. Equal meant worse in reality. He was a product of his environment in many ways. Um, he was not a mean man, but he did not respect the, uh, the, the potential capabilities of African American, African Americans or women to support the war effort. Now, Franklin Delano Roosevelt was much more socially progressive. He forced the Marines and the Navy to accept African Americans and women. Uh, eventually, Holcomb uh, acknowledged that women could make a contribution to the Marine Corps by freeing a man to fight. Uh, he would not uh, give the women in the Marines some fancy acronym like WAVES or WASPs or WAX or SPARS. He called them women Marines. However, he was not so um, uh, tolerant uh, of African Americans. Tens of thousands of Af African Americans served in the U.S. Marine Corps during World War II, and not one of them ever became an officer. Uh, Holcomb was forced to accept them. I have a letter, not relating to African Americans, but actually relating to Filipino Americans. Turns out um, a Filipino American named Louis Padillo, and wouldn't know him from anybody else, but Louis Padillo, right after Pearl Harbor, he's 17 years old, he tries to join the U.S. Marine Corps. Walks up to a recruiter, passes the physical test, passed pass the uh, aptitude test, and he's getting ready to sign on the dot, dotted line. Then he told the recruiter that he was Filipino-American. Now, his father had been born in the Philippines, but he was born in the United States. He had migrated. He was an American citizen, but he was Filipino-American. He was immediately turned away. This is, this is right after Pearl Harbor. I have the letter dated 11 December 1941. Four days after Pearl Harbor, Pearl Harbor was on a Sunday, so by Thursday, he's writing a letter to Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Here's the 17-year-old Philo Filipino-American in his handwriting, writing a letter to Franklin Roosevelt. Of course, everyone did. Roosevelt was getting 500,000 letters a week. But he writes a letter to Roosevelt. Roosevelt, I'm sure, never read it. His 100-person postal staff at the White House sent it over to headquarters Marine Corps. I have the response from a major. A major in the U.S. Marine Corps responded, I'm sorry, we cannot allow you to become a Marine because the Marines are a small elite unit with a diverse uh, uh, number of missions and only Caucasian Americans are capable of handling those missions. And that, was, and that letter came back a month later. 
And that in and of itself is impressive that the turnaround time was just one month when you know the war was spinning up. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. The Marines believed that only Caucasian Americans were capable of being Marines. Holcomb even wrapped his argument against African American after African Americans in his progressive attitudes, his progressive managerial attitudes. He testified uh, before the General Board or before Congress stating that I don't want African Americans or the word Negroes as was, would have been used at the time. He says I don't want African Americans in the US Marines because in order to train them and supervise them I'll have to use my outstanding NCOs and my outstanding officers to do that and I need to use those officers elsewhere. So really he's um, he, he definitely is, is um, definitely was, was what, uh, what was prejudiced and bigoted in his views. Little uh, coda to that story, little, you know, sort of, and now the rest of the story. When Commandant Holcomb retires in December 1943, he has several m months into 1944 where he's going around and giving speeches, doing tours, and that sort of thing of the United States Marine Corps bases. Then he gets posted as U.S. ambassador, what they call U.S. minister to South Africa. Now, what is interesting is he gets along with, with the South Africans okay for a couple of years. He's there basically to work out the Lend-Lease payments. But then in 19, he stays on as ambassador or minister for four years through 1948. In 1946, uh, 60,000 or so black South African gold miners go on strike. And the government puts the boot to them, sends in several thousand soldiers, uh, kills several dozen of them, and injures 3,000, and sends the rest sort of bleeding back to the mines. This sets off, uh, this makes Holcomb angry. He sees what racism was when there were no limits to it. This wasn't sort of institutionalized racism or kind of playing around with policies and procedures. This was blatant racism, and he's gravely offended. And I have the letters that he was writing back to Secretary of State, to the Secretary of State in 1946, his ambassador, he'd report back to Secretary of State in Washington, D.C. He said, these people are living in the dark. The white South African government was living in the dark. These people were undemocratic. The white South African government was undemocratic, op oppressive, and centripetal an outlook. If Holcomb was, if Hol I, 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 can't, I can't read the man's mind, but based on those terms, which those are unequivocal terms, you can't say, you can't, you know, you can't use the term oppressive and say, oh, he was, you're a little bit oppressive, sort of like being a little bit pregnant. You're either oppressive or you're not. You're undemocratic. You're either undemocratic or you're democratic. I think that opens his eyes to how horrific racism can be or could be in the past uh, with um, when there's no limits, no, no limits of even, uh, uh, of even civility. He leaves in 1948 before the new government takes over in South Africa that act actually institutes apartheid. But of course, there had been apartheid and everything but name already in South Africa. There was separation, but there was no equality. Wasn't even, wasn't even, it wasn't even this nice idea of separate but equal in Plessy B. Ferguson. Holcomb sees that, and I believe that he changes his view about race relations. I wasn't able to find his own words written to his wife or an oral history interview where he admits it, but just judging by these words that he's writing in official reports that would have been top secret going back to uh, the State Department in Washington, D.C., he did, he did seem to change his tune, which is good. Uh, it was very hard for me uh, because I came after living with Holcomb for 17 years, Tommy, Thomas, Commandant Holcomb, as I like to call him, General Holcomb. I, uh, it was hard for me to write, you know, kind of bad things about him. But as a historian, I believe that I have, I, I, I serve, I, I serve Cleo, I serve the muse, I, I, I serve uh, the historical gods, and I, as, as an honest historian, I felt like I needed to include that, uh, those episodes in his story. What was really hard, I had the great good fortune of meeting uh, Holcomb's late daughter-in-law, and then I also met his granddaughters, and I had to kind of explain to this before the book was published to his granddaughters that, all right, 
You know, 99% of my book says your granddaddy was a great guy, great leader, great commandant, great Marine, but then there's this race issue thing. And I wasn't going to change. They weren't going to forbid me to do it, and they didn't. They just said, you've got the sources. We trust you to write what you should write. But it was still kind of hard. So this is, a, you know, an object lesson for any of you who are students or historians or journalists or whatever. You've got to, you've got to if you know something about someone, you kind of need to, to say it. So anyway... But Holcomb, I, did, I do believe, did reform over time. As a result of seven years of serving as a, as a commandant of the Marine Corps, Chief of Operations and Commander-in-Chief of the United States Fleet, Ernest King, he was the senior naval officer and Holcomb's supervisor, had this to write about Holcomb in 1944 after he retired. He wrote, under Holcomb's direction, the Marine Corps successfully met the greatest test in its history by forging a huge mass of untrained officers and men into efficient tactical units, especially organized, equipped, and trained for the complicated amphibious operations which have characterized the war in the Pacific, end quote. I think this really does touch on all the, all the hard work that Holcomb uh, you know, put in during World War II. So, uh, as a result, I would argue that Commandant Thomas Holcomb deserves to be uh, uh, placed among the greats of the Commandants of the Marine Corps, the John Lejeunes, the Vandegrifts, the Alfred uh, Grays. But he also deserves to be placed among the great managers of World War II, the Chester Nimitzes, the Dwight D. Eisenhowers, uh, the George Marshalls. Like these men, Holcomb did not crave the spotlight unless the spotlight could, him getting to the spotlight could help the Marine Corps, help the war effort. Holcomb shared the similar temperaments, the similar skills, and the similar intellectual abilities of these men. He may not have had the cool nickname like Brute Krulak or Red Mike Edson or Chesty Puller or Howling Mad Smith, but he did have these other skills. He was the right man at the right place at the right time to prepare the Marine Corps for victory. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. I uh, just want to say I really enjoyed your talk. It was um, amazing, really. Um, my dad was a Guadalcanal veteran, and uh, he enlisted in the Marine Corps in 1940. So the, what I wanted to ask you to comment on was he always, he never, people who here know me, I did hundreds of hours of, vet of interviews with Guadalcanal veterans. But my dad never, ever talked about the war at all, never said you know, not one word to me about what he did. But the one thing he would always talk about was the old Marine Corps before the war. And um, he always spoke of that with great affection, almost like, uh, I don't know how to describe it really, like you would like a Notre Dame football history or something like and I wondered if you could comment a little bit on the differences between, you know, the pre-war before it became, you know, 400,000 and what it was like back then. Because I know he came in, he was only 16, but he came in right on the tail end of that. But I think he always considered himself closer to that older generation than the newer generation, which came in after Pearl Harbor. So I wondered if you could comment on that. Sure. Uh, the old core, or the old breed, uh, the interwar year Marines. Uh, the Marine Corps was so small before World War II. As I said, 18,000, 20,000 officers and men. Everyone knew everyone. Uh, the, even the, um, the sales pitch that Marine Corps public relations and Marine Corps recruiters made to the interwar Marines was different than wartime. During the interwar years, the 1920s and 30s, the recruiters said, join the Marines for adventure, for a job, to travel, uh, you know, to, to, see, to see beautiful Caribbean deserted desert islands and that sort of thing, um, to, to visit Haiti and, and to go to China. They, they, they painted the Corps as, a, as an opportunity. Uh, then during the wartime, uh, the advertisements changed to, you know, remember Pearl Harbor, join the Marines to fight the Japanese and that sort of thing. Um, th that's one difference. I think the other difference is... Um, the kind of pace and the size of the Corps, and uh, also the length of service. During, during the interwar years, you, could, you were lucky as a Marine Corps officer with 40 years in to retire as a major, 
lucky. You might spend 15 years as a, as a captain or 10 years as a lieutenant. So there's a lot more, um, uh, it's a lot slower pace in terms of career progression. I also think that there is a um, kind of a pride among those Marines that would have joined either during World War II or right after World War II because they were the ones that would have gone to Nicaragua and, 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 those, and those areas. And then, yeah, your father's joining in 1940 is right in that transition when the, uh, when the, Marine, uh, when the Marines become exponentially larger. By the way, by Pearl Harbor, the Marines stood about 60,000 men. So two years later, when Holcomb retires, they're at 385,000 men. Um, it's just, it, it is, I, I think the football analogy might be, um, might be as good an analogy as anything, talking about, you know, Newt Rockney or something along, along those lines. There is a, um, a nostalgia, all, I, and I don't want to degrade, I don't want to use the word nostalgia to degrade anything. It was, it was a nostalgia and love for the core. Of course, then the new breed, though, it was the new breed that had to go, that did go and fight at Guadalcanal, at Iwo Jima, on Peleliu. So the new breed also, you know, deserves their props and their credit for, you know, putting, uh, for, you know, surviving and succeeding against really, really tough odds. Could you comment on his... Uh but you mentioned that he was in China, it was, would you say, six years or so? Uh, Thirteen years, including one six-year stretch. And what did he do in China? Uh, was he there just with the uh, concession armies? Because he was there after, after uh, the, uh, what do you call it, the Boxer Rebellion. But what actually were the campaigns did he do in, in, in China for, for his, his, his long tour, or his entire tour? Right. Um, Just one, one more. I, had, no, please, I have to say this. Oh, please, please. Uh, I, I had an uncle who was at Bella Wood and in the Marine Corps, and, but he was a wartime Marine there. But he always told me as a boy the Marine Corps became an uh, enforcer for Standard Oil and United Fruit. So I had a, you know, yeah. took me a long time to figure that out. Yeah, no, but, no, no. but I was interested in the actual campaigning that he might have participated in in China. All right, all right. Well, I'll I'll, I'll deal with your first or your second little comment first. Uh, the, the Marines have been known as the State Department's policemen. You know, the State Department's police. So that's that's the whole, you know, the soldiers or whatever, the enforcers for United Fruit and so on. Um, he he didn't he didn't go on any campaigns or participate in any combat in China. Uh, when he was there, he was an officer, so he was co uh, uh, commanding essentially, um, you know, embassy guards and that sort of thing. When he's there as a junior officer, he would have been traveling around visiting different Marine Corps bases. Then when he goes back, his last tour is 1927 to 1930, where he's a full colonel and commanding the legation guard at Peking, if memory serves, which was the senior Marine in, in, in the country. So then he would have been interacting with, uh, uh, with the um, international officers from Europe and, and Japan and so on that were also stationed there. So it, was, it, wasn't, it wasn't a, 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 a campaign tour with combat action. It was, a, it was, it was a sort of, uh, later on by the 19, late 1920s, he was also spying and gathering intelligence and talking at the, at, 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 at the dinner table at parties with his colleagues and trying to gather more and more information. So it would have been, it would have been essentially a garrison command. To use current terminology, he would have been a garrison commander most of the time. Oh, no. No, 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 no. He's sort of the rest of them spying on the Chinese Civil War. Yeah, it was gathering information and that sort of thing. Yes. Yes. Since he was such a successful commandant, how come they retired him? Ah, how come they retired him? That's a very good question. He retired. Well, first of all, Franklin Roosevelt could have kept him on after the age of 64. Franklin Roosevelt was president. We're in a war. You can keep, I mean, Leahy, uh, uh, Admiral Leahy was essentially chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Uh, he was over age, over 64. Holcomb had been commandant for seven years and one month, and, I, and from reading his personal letters, he was tired. When you look at when he was commandant, 1936 to 1943, that's three years of famine, 
and then four years of feasting. He had a lot to do. He was there. He was probably went to church with his wife at the Episcopal Church in D.C. on December 7th, 1941, gets home for lunch, gets a phone call to get over the Navy Department. I mean, these are stressful things. He was tired. Um, he also had someone waiting in the wings that he been, had been grooming. As early as October 1942, when Holcomb visited Guadalcanal, he was already grooming Alexander Vandergriff to be the next commandant. So there was a legitimate replacement. And as it worked out for the Marine Corps, uh, Vandergriff becomes Marine Commandant in 1944. He has the prestige of Guadalcanal and the prestige of winning the war with the Marines. So then when the unification crisis comes up in the post-war years, Vandergriff has the notoriety and the credibility to help you know, maintain the Marine Corps' uh, existence. So, but I, I think he was tired, uh, and, and he had always enforced it on his subordinates. Everyone in the Marine Corps would retire at age 64. Uh, there, was, there, was some, some, uh, there was a balancing act there. I think, I think that Roosevelt did want to keep him around, but that's the way it worked out. He was tired. Yes? I'm just curious, after all your years of research of him, what was the most interesting fact that you never knew about him over all the span of research you did? Most interesting fact. Um, I think the thing that interested me most was his marksmanship. I've done a little bit of shooting myself. After he stopped being a marksman, after 1913 was the last Marine Corps rifle team he commanded, he took up photography. And there's letters in his personal papers every year or two about he's buying this new camera or he wants to buy this other camera. And his family donated hundreds of his own photographs of landscapes, of flowers, of houses, and so on. He had an eye. And I think what is interesting, there's a, I've got a little paragraph about it in my book, but the same sort of skill that you need as a 600-yard a marksman, waiting for the right breath, waiting for the right moment, looking for the right, waiting for the right wind, or testing the wind, uh, and then the same sort of skills in terms of photography, waiting for the, uh, for the clouds to pass, waiting for the right moment, framing it correctly. Those same sorts of skills, the patience uh, and the eye for when it's right to pull the trigger or you know, click the camera, those are similar skills, and I think that also shows a lot about him as a person. He was a very patient person. He hardly ever lose, uh, lost his temper. And the only time he lost his temper was when he was mad because someone was mistreating the Marine Corps or mistreating the men in his unit. So that was, it, 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 it might sound a little, I don't know, I don't know what, it might sound a little trite, but those skills as a marksman, the skills as, as a photographer, and the patience and the, uh, you know, uh, uh, the uh, long-suffering, I guess, uh, that he did as commandant to see the Marine Corps through. I think that was very interesting. It was a gee whiz sort of moment. I was in the amphibian forces. We landed a lot of Army personnel. We could carry 250 troops on an LCI. Put them on the beach and get the hell out. Oh, yeah. The first, what they uh, came about with the amphibs, the LCVPs, were the Higgins boats that you mentioned here before. And you had pictures of them. They found out in Europe that they needed a different type of ship to land the troops because the LCVPs and the Higgins boats were a wide open tub, more or less. And they found out the first four minutes of a landing was where the most casualties came about. Consequently, the uh, LCI rocket was uh, developed. They, they uh, put rockets on two LCIs, and they found out that four minute interval by the time the troops were leaving, the Japs were coming out of their foxholes, their tunnels, and just laying on the beach after the bombardment of all of the uh, ships, the fleets that was out there, bombing and, and shelling the beaches for hours, a half a day. And uh, the biggest casualties was right there at the beach, where the men could not get ashore to defend themselves. 
There's no cover. There's no, nope. there's no, no place for them to hide, and they're vulnerable. And, uh, yes, sir. What happened then? Uh, the ch the change was rapidly coming from the old uh, the Higgins and the uh, LCVs. Yes, sir. Thank you. A couple of points. When you talk about the old breed for the Second World War, it sounds very similar to the experience of the German army with the 100,000 Reichs there, where those were the officers that provided the corps for the army in the Second World War. And uh, two things struck me as being interesting on your presentation. You mentioned that the Holcomb developed the publicity department, public relations of press corps. How come he never capitalized on that in order to build up his position? Because unless you're a specialist, you wouldn't really rank him with the uh, folks you ranked up there on that picture. And the third thing I'd like to ask about is, have you seen the series The Pacific that was done on HBO, and how would you evaluate that in terms of presenting the dynamic between the relationship of the old breed and the uh, new Marines who were coming in because E.B. Sledge wrote a book on that uh, about with the old breed of Kowloon, Okinawa. Thank you. Yes. All right. Um, I hate it when people ask me multiple part questions. Uh, <laughs> let me go with the... Um, with the idea of, about the public relations. Holcomb, he was not, he, he did develop, I mean, public relations, and the Marines have, have always done public relations very well from the beginning of the 20th century. He just kind of uh, expanded on what was already there and, and established combat correspondence and that sort of thing. But his, his goal was not self-glory. If he could give an important speech or speak to, uh, speak on the radio or do an interview for a newspaper, he would, but it would be about the Marines, not about him. I, I and, and, and I, you know, I'll draw a comparison between him and uh, him and Chester Nimitz and Holcomb and MacArthur. Chester Nimitz had one or two camera people following him around. Chester Nimitz never grabbed the spotlight either. Never tried to. Douglas MacArthur, he had you know a couple of companies worth of camera people. It wasn't it wasn't a landing. He he'd go back and come off the landing craft again and again and again until he got it right. It was about MacArthur. And you could say that about, you know, uh, George Patton. You could say that about, to some degree, about Howling Mad Smith, too. What I find interesting is the U.S. military seems to have these role players. you got to have the Norman Schwarzkopf, but you also have to have the Colin Powell. You, uh, they, uh, the military has these role players. you got to have the fiery sort of battlefield leader at times to get the troops stoked up, to get them to raise morale, to, to, to have that credibility. So Holcomb, but Holcomb was a humble man. He, he really was not out for himself. He didn't exploit the fact that he was a commandant and go on to become CEO of some company after he retired. Of course, he also married Rich, which helped. Uh, <laughs> helped a lot. So he was, you know, he was, when he was at the Naval War College, he had a 50-foot yacht to ride around Newport and, and, and all that. So he, he, he was fine. But um, so he, he just wasn't about himself. Now, as for the Pacific War... I confess that at the time that the Pacific War was on, I did not have HBO, and I need to watch uh, uh, to watch uh, the video. I really do, so I apologize. I can't answer that. All I can say is the Band of Brothers video I thought was superb. So they're going to have to. That's going to have to raise. That sets the bar really, really high. Really, really high. I was trying to inform both the documentary for the World War II Center, and uh, having viewed both of them, uh, I would give. Band of Brothers, two stars, and I would give the Pacific four stars. Ah, all right. And it's head and shoulders above it for three reasons. First of all, there is more realistic combat presented in the Pacific. Secondly, the characters they, they capitalized on, John Basso and E.B. Sledge and uh, uh, Robert Leakey, uh, are much more developed in terms of their personal relationship, plus the fact that it does go into the inter-service rivalries with in the Marine Corps between the old breed and the new breed and the logistics of things that happen. So when you see it, I think you'll be very favorably impressed based upon your background uh, with uh, Holcomb. Well, uh, maybe I'll comment. Oh, Definitely good. watch it. There's one particularly harrowing scene, which I think uh, harkens back almost to the Civil War, where it shows uh, the Marines have to charge across a uh, Japanese airfield, and it's like half a mile from the Japanese dug in positions around the control towers on the hangars and the jungle, and it looks like pickets charge mm -hmm. in the series. When you see it there, you would, it's the most impressive thing I've ever seen in terms of 
restaging Marine Corps mm -hmm. combat that's ever been done on site. Well, maybe if uh, if uh, Paul will have me back in another couple of years, I can I can answer that question next time. Thank you. I think uh, we're beginning to get late, so maybe one more question. Is that okay with you? Uh, one more question, yeah, Paul. That's fine. All right. There was a question up here. Up here. What really was the history when he was the commandant? What were his tactical responsibilities? They compared to uh, General uh, General Holland Smith, who you mentioned, or or any of the Marine commanders uh, of divisions in the either Halsey's Pacific or MacArthur's Pacific. All right. Was it just was he just an administrator, or what, did he have any tactical responsibilities? If you want to say just an administrator, he was just an administrator. Although it, you know, it's, it's George uh, yeah, George Marshall was just an administrator. But when you when you start saying that, he had to interact with Congress, and that's its own set of you know, that's that's its own version of combat dealing with Congress. Obviously, um, he he kept tabs on his commanding officers, but he did not exercise com or he did not exercise operational command. He did not have input on you know which beach beach is going to be you know attacked at a particular time he would have input on which uh, the uh, the next island that would be attacked though he would have input but that would have been a strategic decision made back in washington so he he was he was managing uh the marine corps uh at home and he tried to put the right people at the right place at the right time out in the pacific ocean whether it's and howling matt smith was a fantastic corps commander he should have been out as a corps commander. Uh, Vandegrift was solid. Roy Geiger was solid. There were other very, very good commanders. Julian Smith were solid. So it was their responsibility. He was, he was making sure that the trains ran on time and the holy water and the cigarettes and the socks and the ammunition and the food all got out to them in a timely manner and that replacements got out there. So, And uh, to say just an administrator, it's, it's one of the things I had to struggle with. How do I, how do I write in vivid prolific prose about pushing pencils. He pushed them. He pushed them really, really well. He pushed them flawless. I don't know. Anyway. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. George Marshall. Yeah, yeah. George Marshall did it. Yeah, just an administrator. All right. Well, on that note, I want to thank you for attending. Uh, the um, books are on sale back there. I'll be happy to inscribe them. If you have a student ID of any sort, uh, they're $20. If you're not a student, it'll be $30. Uh, the retail is $36, so you're getting a discount one way or another. But I want to try to help out the, uh, uh, the students, having been a student myself until 2007. So I'll be happy to uh, entertain more questions, and I look forward to talking with you informally. Thank you very much. Let us all say you for a really good presentation. And also, like any veteran from World War II, also the standards. We'd like to recognize our veterans within the, within the audience. Veterans from World War II, if you would, please stand. Okay, All right, ladies and gentlemen, please, as Dave said, we'll be in the rear of the room to uh, sell books and answer any questions. Hope to see you all back for our next presentation, which will be at the beginning of August. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Oh, Have a nice oh, October. October. <laughs> October. <laughs> Right. All right. Thank you, everybody. Have a nice evening. We hope you enjoyed this program. For more information on the Center for World War II Studies, visit brookdalecc.edu forward slash pages forward slash 730.asp. This program series is available for sponsorship by corporations and organizations. You can find out more information about sponsorship at bit.ly forward slash content sponsorship. We produce this program in the studios of Lubetkin Global Communications in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, on the web at lubetkin.net. This program is copyright Lubetkin Communications and all rights are reserved. No reposting or other use of this program may be made without written permission from the copyright owner. For Paul Zygo and everyone at the Brookdale Center for World War II Studies, this is Steve Lubetkin. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you out there on the net. Take good care.